All right, guys, Mr. Short here. Today we're going to be talking about Jackson through Tyler. Shouldn't take us more than about 25, 30 minutes. Uh, we've already mentioned Jackson. We talked about the uh, the rise in Jacksonian democracy. We've already talked about the corrupt bargain. But it is still important to sort of set the stage with uh, important elections that happened prior to this time. We're going to get into these other elections in 1840 and 1844. But let's recall uh, 1824. We've got John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, you know, Andrew Jackson, the corrupt bargain. Clay gives support to Henry or John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams wins the election. And uh, for the next four years, essentially, Jackson is trying to use this as political capital so that he gets elected against the elite, against these schemers. And in 1828, Jackson is elected, our first Democrat. We, we, will, uh, we will then see a split. We've going to have what, what's known as national Republicans and Democrats. Uh, 1832, uh, Jackson is reelected. Uh, and then we'll talk about important elections after that. Uh, 36 is Van Buren. We'll talk about 40 and 44 in here as well. Okay. So let's do some recapping here. Uh, nullification crisis. Uh, we have mentioned this. If we have not yet talked about it in depth, we will do so, depending on you know who's listening to this lecture. Uh, remember, the, the, no, the South Carolina is still unhappy about the tariff of abominations. We did mention this one. What we may not have mentioned is, is how high this tariff was. This tariff was a 45% tariff, a really favored northern manufacturing, really angered the South because they did a lot of international trade. Uh, so South Carolina is very upset. They have what's known as the South Carolina Exposition, where they try to rally other states in the South to, uh, to declare these laws, this tariff, uh, null and void. And it, it doesn't go, it doesn't work. Uh, but what ends up happening is there is a, another tariff in 1832 uh, this is under uh, Jackson. Uh, the first tariff of abominations was was started at the end of uh, John Quincy Adams' presidency. So you could say that he's responsible for it, but Jackson is the one who has to deal with it. So uh, in 1832, Andrew Jackson is president when we have a new tariff, a little bit smaller than the, the one of 1828. This one is essentially a 35% tariff, uh, but it still falls short of what South Carolina wants and the South in general. And so this is the nullification crisis. This is where states are not only protesting, but violently protesting, threatening secession, threatening protest. And Andrew Jackson has to take a stand and declare that, no, the union is first and foremost. The union cannot be divided. So South Carolina, again, they have the special session that declares the existing tariff null and void within South Carolina. They also start making military preparations to go to war. Woo, secession. Uh, and they actually, uh, again, secession, they threatened to take themselves out of the Union if Washington tried to collect any sort of customs duties from this tariff. Okay? This angers Andrew Jackson. We already talked about you know, how uh, John Calhoun was his vice president as well as John Quincy Adams' vice president. Now Andrew Jackson really hates Calhoun. As we talked about, you know, John, John C. Calhoun is the one who uh, tried to anonymously you know, talk about the evils of this tariff, and so he published his his uh, paper on the evils of this uh, tariff and trying to rile people up and uh, basically setting up the South Carolina Exposition. So at this point, there there's a there's a huge divide between Jackson, the, the president, and his vice president John C. Calhoun. Andrew Jackson at a dinner, uh, people thought he was on the fence, but he pledged to keep the Union together. Uh, he even sent a proclamation to South Carolina, the governor of South Carolina. Uh, Robert Haynes saying that nullification was not justified. Okay, we have, depending on where we are in the lecture and the, and the, the school year, or we will, <laughs> depending on where we are, uh, get into some primary source documents about nullification and how Andrew Jackson feels and how the other side feels about their rights to nullify laws. Okay, so Henry Clay is now in the Senate. He is going to throw his support towards his compromise bill, which is going to reduce the tariff of 1832 to levels that are tolerable okay um so just to recap you know if you're if curious as to you know the differences in these tariffs the first tariff 1828 i said 45 percent huge uh the second tariff this is the one that's the, at the at the heart of the nullification crisis this is the tariff of 1832 this one was 35 percent well the compromise tariff is going to be down to 20 percent so it's a pretty low tariff and it kind of calms people down and again it is known as the compromise tariff of 1833 uh, this this bill is going to end the nullification crisis, at least the threats of secession. It's still going to cause a rift between the North and the South to grow. More sectionalism, uh, more uh, untrusting you know, Southerners of the North. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, no troops are now needed. No fighting is going to happen. At the same time, they passed the compromise tariff. The, the Congress passes something called the force bill. Okay, and, and this should remind you of all those protests that happened because of the Stamp Act. If you recall, the Stamp Act angered so many colonists and, and eventually, because it angered Britain's uh, citizens as well, eventually Britain is going to repeal the Stamp Act and everyone's like, yay, this is awesome. Uh, and then right afterward, they pass something that's just as bad called the Declaratory Act, which allows them to sim uh, simply you know, tax in the new world as they would anywhere in their empire. Okay. I, I want you to recall that story and that, and that fact because the force bill, which which should be seen as a, as a victory, uh, at least the compromise tariff should be seen as a victory, the force bill kind of negates any sort of victory because the force bill allows the federal government to collect any duties they want using the army and the navy if necessary. So it's not a victory at all for South Carolina. South, South Carolina actually calls it the bloody bill because it is you know, giving the federal government more power to enforce what they consider to be unnecessary in these high tariffs, okay? So no other Southern states joined South Carolina in its protest, just like no other Southern state joined South Carolina in its uh, exposition, okay? So <clears throat> there is still gonna be threat of civil war within South Carolina. Behind the scenes, John C. Calhoun will still push for, you know, his, his constituents, you know, against the federal overreach of the federal government. Um, in a sort of a last act, they, uh, they repeal their ordinance of nullification. So they, they say, okay, we accept the compromise tariff, we accept any other tariffs that are on the books, uh, but at the same time, they will uh, vocally nullify the Force Act. And so they sort of leave with their you know, tails tucked between their legs and say, well, we lost our battle against the tariff, but we're gonna win the battle against the Force Act. So they say it itself has no power whatsoever, okay? So again, in 1833, there's no clear-cut winner as far as you know the the northern industrialists or the southern farmers, uh, but we do still see the seeds of secession. And in fact, they called Charleston, South Carolina, the cradle of secession. Okay, so you know all that's going on. You know Andrew Jackson's going to try to run for re-election. How he deals with the nullification crisis, how he deals with Native Americans, that's going to determine whether he is uh, in fact elected. Now recall that Andrew Jackson. Is sort of a champion of the common man. He extends democracy. Uh, he he gets a lot of support for his new Democratic Party from the common man, the non-elite. Okay, so in 1832, our our uh, runners are Henry Clay. He's running uh, for the National Republican ticket, and his uh, slogan is "Freedom and Clay." Okay, Andrew Jackson, of course, the Democrat, and we have our first third party, uh, William Wirt. Not that important that you remember him, but this is the the introduction of our first uh, third party. It's essentially an anti-elitist third party. Uh, I don't even have a picture of them. They're not a very important third party, but they are the first third party, okay? So the National Nominating Committee formed and they adopted formal platforms which publicized their positions on the issue. So this is the first time we really get, you know, the word out as far as what these nominating committees are for, what each party is for. Uh, and, and essentially we're down to two candidates, of course, Clay. Clay is sort of representing the Northeast, the elitist. Whereas Jackson is, is very heavily uh, supported in the South and the West for his victories in the Seminole Wars, his victories uh, in the, the Battle of New Orleans, and of course, the expansion of democracy. So Andrew Jackson definitely has the people behind him in his uh, election. And of course, Andrew Jackson wins the third party. Uh, they only carry Vermont as far as the uh, electoral vote. Henry Clay is crushed. Uh, the, he had he'd set this uh, system up. He had done so much for America, and he will never become president of the United States. Okay. As soon as Andrew Jackson wins, he begins withdrawing funds from the National Bank. He does not trust the National Bank. He thinks that the industrialists have too much power. He thinks that foreign investors have too much control over American financial interests. He believes that states should indeed have the power to run their own banks instead of a national system, uh, which we talked about with Hamilton. Okay. So what we have is uh, he starts to kill the National Bank of the United States, okay? Surplus funds from uh, the National Bank are put in what they call pet banks, uh, pro Jackson. Um, he is gonna fire multiple secretaries of the treasury until they decide to take money out of these federal banks and put them into pet banks. So he makes an order, uh, his cabinet members refuse to do what he wants, so he keeps firing them. He fires, I don't know how many, two or three of them until Roger Taney agrees to do this, and essentially with no money in these national banks, it essentially dies, okay? So 
we will or have, depending on where we are in this lecture, uh, talk more about the National Bank and how Jackson and why Jackson decides to kill it. Okay. So other issues that are affecting Andrew Jackson during this time, uh, Native Americans. Okay. Uh, Jackson has a very interesting history with the Native Americans. He himself grew up to sort of hate his local tribe, the Cherokee. Uh, he's never liked Native Americans. In fact, he goes into Florida uh, and, and ends up you know, killing a lot of Native Americans in disputes over territory. Uh, even before the adams onus Treaty, he becomes sort of a hero there for you know, defeating the savage. Uh, so he's, he's very much pro-America, very much anti-Native American. Uh, he is going to pass something called the Indian Removal Act, and we're going to read part of it. Uh, part of it is, seems very noble. Uh, he's, he's, he's basically giving reasons why they would want to leave the, the home of their ancestors and go to a better place, i.e. places like Oklahoma. Um, but it's not going to be well received. His, his successor, Martin Van Buren, will be the one who takes over and forces this trail of tears in, during his presidency. A uh, very important court case uh, that is going to promote the sovereignty okay, is going to promote the sovereignty of Native Americans. It's called Worcester versus Georgia. 